Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to today's uh, professional lunch at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I'm Anthony Rowley, first vice president of the club, and it's my pleasure today to act as moderator and to introduce our speaker on my right, who is Paul Grunvelt, who is chief Asia-Pacific economist at S&P Global Ratings. And he's going to talk to us today about um, the 1997 Asian financial crisis and lessons learned from that crisis, which was 20 years ago, of course, and it may seem a bit odd to be dredging up history after 20 years, but unless we learn lessons from um, crises, we uh, run the risk of uh, go, uh, finding ourselves in a fresh crisis. Um, uh, the situation today in Asia, of course, is very different uh, from the 1997 and situation and uh, indeed the re region is far better prepared now than it was in those days. It has very large foreign exchange reserves, it has flexible exchange rates and so it's, you might say, more immune to shocks. But um, perhaps one thing worth bearing in mind, I know Paul is going to talk about this, is that there has been a huge build up in recent years of debt, especially corporate debt in Asia and elsewhere in the world, especially in the emerging market uh, economies. And um, we're about to enter an era of rising interest rates, and that raises some interesting questions about whether uh, all this debt can be paid or repaid or serviced in the an era of rising interest rates. But um, Paul is the expert. I'm not going to say any more on this. Um, he is, as I said, a managing director and chief economist, um, Asia Pacific, Pacific at S&P Global Ratings. Uh, he's based in Singapore, where he leads the economic research agenda and serves as the primary spokesperson on macroeconomic matters right across the Asia region. Before joining S&P Global Ratings, Paul spent five years at um, ANZ, Australia and New Zealand Banking Group, as Asia Chief Economist, Asia Pacific Chief Economist. Um, he also has had very extensive experience in other institutions. He worked at the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, for nearly 16 years. Um, <laughs> where he led the team producing the IMF's Asian Regional Outlook reports. He was also the IMF resident representative to Hong Kong and also to South Korea, um, the deputy chief of the China division and the country desk officer for Australia. Paul has a PhD in economics from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in economics and mathematics from the University of Texas. So um, you have a fuller bio on your um, handouts, so I'll um, stop at that point. Let me remind you to switch off your cell phones, or put them on mana mode, please. And Mine please... Too. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> yeah, please, if you don't mind, yes. We don't want you to interrupt yourself. Um, so please join me in welcoming Paul, uh, Paul Grun. Um, um, going to walk around, so I think better on my feet. So um, thanks, uh, Anthony, and the clicker is coming. But just as a background, uh, I'm Paul Grunewald. I'm the chief economist for Asia uh, Pacific. Um, this topic is kind of close to my heart, um, uh, not because I had a front row seat. I was actually in the play, right? So uh, I was on the IMF team uh, that was in Korea during the Christmas holidays, 1997, uh, 1998. So uh, this year is a special year because a lot of people are looking back 10 years uh, to the global uh, financial crisis that began in the US. But here in Asia, we're looking back 20 years uh, for the Asia financial crisis uh, anniversary. So um, so what's the roadmap? Uh, again, I'm going to uh, talk for about 20-ish uh, minutes, and then we can do uh, some Q&A. Oh, by the way, we're going to, Anthony, we're going to dis distribute this, right? This is not top secret material, so you don't, you don't need to take photos or, uh, right? So. Great, all right, great. Um, so I wanna set the stage because I think the run up to the Asia crisis is quite important. What was the thinking? Um, then we'll talk about what happened. Uh, since I did work for the IMF, I want to address this question, did the IMF uh, help? I've got my disclosure there in small print that I was actually on the uh, Korea team. And then lessons for today. Uh, you will notice uh, one country that begins with a C will be prominently missing from my narrative. I'm not gonna talk about it uh, until the very end, but uh, many um, 
people are focused on uh, vulnerabilities around that country at present, and then we can take some uh, questions. So I want to set the stage for this East Asian um, miracle. And again, uh, those of you who are old enough, looks like most of you, but not all of you uh, in the room. Um, if you think back uh, to the 1990s, uh, we had this Asian miracle. So I just put up some average GDP growth rates. So these are GDP growth rates for the decade beginning 1985, uh, ending 1995. I've got the uh, Asian countries in dark blue and the big three LATAM countries uh, in light blue. You will notice a difference uh, between the uh, two groups. So um, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Korea, and Thailand uh, were growing uh, in high single digit rates on average over an entire decade, and um, the LATAM countries were struggling to grow by, uh, by two or three uh, percent. Um, I was actually working on Latin America at the time, uh, the mid-90s, uh, with the IMF, and a lot of us were asking ourselves, how can those Asian guys grow two to three times uh, faster than uh, Latin America? When I talk about the crisis countries, we'll take uh, Hong Kong and Singapore out of that group uh, for reasons that should be obvious, but we can uh, talk about that, but uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, and Thailand are the four uh, what I call crisis-affected countries um, in Asia. So a um, big important book came out in 1993. Uh, I'm not picking on, picking on the World Bank, but they put out the book, so I'm going to sort of cite them here. Um, it was called The East Asian Miracle, and uh, this was kind of the uh, official blessing, right? This was the imprimatur, um, you know, Asia's time uh, had come, and really the, the meaning of this, at least to me, was that um, this spectacular experience that we saw in Japan uh, in the post-war era, you know, could be replicated. You know, Asia, Asia had found the secret uh, formula and uh, LATAM uh, did not find the secret, secret formula. So there was this blessing um, conferred on the Asian uh, economies that uh, you know, they'd, found, they'd found the right mix of policy structures, et cetera, uh, that would enable uh, fast growth. So um, this is an example of gross oversimplification, but I want to put the two models uh, on a slide uh, so that we can think about what the differences uh, were. Let's start with... Um, Latin America, those countries were really built on something that we call import substitution. So it's a let's do it ourselves model. Let's block stuff coming into our country and we'll figure out how to do it ourselves. So rather than using our precious foreign reserves or foreign currencies to buy stuff from the rest of the world, let's kind of block that and uh, do it ourselves domestically. Um, so there wasn't you know, wasn't put this way, but that's not a formula to compete with the rest of the world. You're actually blocking off uh, sources of competition with the rest of the world. These countries also had relatively low savings. Uh, you saw the so-called twin deficits, fiscal deficits, uh, current account deficits. So you needed the foreign uh, financing. But I think the global economy was seen as kind of a risky place, right? We wanted to block it off. We wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we didn't have too much uh, Competition and that, in a nutshell, grossly oversimplifying the issue, but that is the uh, LATAM model. Very different from the Asian Tigers model. This, these were export promotion models. Let's use the global economy as a platform. Let's open up um, our what we call the traded goods sector. Let's open it up to competition. Maybe we give them some, you know, state subsidies or preferential access uh, to credit. But the idea is the global economy is a platform. We can join that platform. Our firms can learn to be successful. We can move up the value chain and you know, follow countries like uh, Japan. Um, these were typically high savings countries. As you'll see in a minute, they didn't have uh, large uh, fiscal deficits. Uh, sometimes they had uh, current account deficits. And they're largely self-funded. So between these two models, again, the kind of blessing was given uh, to the uh, Asian model, the outward-looking export promotion 
promotion, um, you know, global economy as a as a platform uh, model. Just to give you a couple of um, couple of uh, key indicators to think about. This is the run up to the Asian financial crisis. The crisis officially started in July 1997 when the peg of the Thai bot uh, to the U.S. dollar uh, broke. But if you look at this period going up to the um, uh, the crisis, and again, these are the four um, these are the four uh, crisis affected economies: Indonesia, Malaysia, South Korea, and Thailand. They're all running fiscal surpluses. So if your model says problems start with the government and the fiscal accounts and government spending beyond their means. There's no evidence that you have any problem um, in these uh, in these uh, countries. Um, again, there's another part of the story back then, something called the Washington Consensus. Uh, that was that markets are good, trade is good, but the private sector knows what it's doing. So if you're looking for problems, you got to look in the public sector. And here, um, you don't see any real problems in the uh, public sector as long as the fiscal balance. If you look at the current account balance, the picture's a little bit mixed. So we've got South Korea. Korea and Indonesia here with very modest um, current account deficits, uh, less than two percentage points of GDP. The story was different here uh, in Malaysia and um, Thailand. Uh, to be fair to the IMF, the IMF was warning repeatedly um, giving uh, warnings to the Thais that said their external uh, position was unsustainable. Uh, they needed to rein it in. But again, from the previous slide, this stuff here is being generated by the private sector, and the private sector knows what it's doing, right? So if, the, if there's a fiscal surplus and a current account deficit, we don't worry about that uh, so much. So these are the four, um, these are the four uh, countries. Oh, I didn't tell you the joke. On the previous slide, um, you know, the IMF acronym uh, means International Monetary Fund, but internally there's a joke that it means it's mostly fiscal. So if you look at the fiscal accounts, that's where you're going to find uh, the problem. Sorry, I didn't cue up my joke there. Um, did anybody not believe the story, right? Were there any skeptics out there? A um, couple of folks who I wanted to uh, identify. Uh, Paul Krugman, who's obviously still around, very successful economist, very successful uh, commentator at the New York Times. And another guy who you probably haven't heard of, his name is Alwyn Young. Uh, his claim to fame is that we were classmates together at Columbia. We were getting our PhD together. I think he did better than I did. But they were looking at these Asian economies, and they said, well, wait a minute. You know, this Asian model is not really built on productivity growth and moving up the value chain. We're just kind of throwing a lot of investment at the economy. Uh, that might sound like the economy with a C that I'm going to talk about uh, later. But, um, you know, it's sort of just capital deepening. It's not, we're not really getting any productivity uh, out of this story. Um, we've got these artificially high savings rates. They really come from financial repression more than kind of households and firms optimizing their choices, which is the way we like to think about it uh, in economics. Um, credit may not be allocated properly. You may have a lot of maybe not identified, but latent uh, non-performing assets uh, in your financial system. And, um, you know, the fund, again, was warning uh, Thailand, but no one was really thinking about these, uh, this way of kind of analyzing uh, the problem. It was, um, it was uh, kind of an outlier view. Uh, at the time. So that's the backdrop, you know, leading up to 1997. Uh, Asia got the gold star, no big imbalances, particularly in the fiscal. So uh, what happened? Well, I, I took some of these slides from some old IMF documents uh, from the late uh, 90s. This one tells a story uh, pretty clearly. The first sign of trouble was the exchange rates. Um, back then, most of these countries were pegging their currency uh, to the US dollar. Um, that works as long as it, it works as long as it works, and when it stops working, uh, it's a problem. It basically says if you're the Thai bot uh, and you're in Thailand and the bots pegged to the US dollar, 26 Thai bots gets you one dollar, one dollar gets you 26 Thai bot. You can borrow in US dollars, uh, try to invest it domestically, and if the exchange rate's fixed, you can go back later with your 26 Thai bots and get your dollar back that you can use to pay your debt service. If your peg breaks and now you need 52 Thai bot, 
two times what you thought you needed before, then you're going to have a problem uh, repaying your debt. And you can see, and I'll talk about this in a minute, these currency pegs broke one after another uh, in 1997, 1998. Thailand went first. Uh, then we saw uh, Malaysia, Philippines was in there as well. Then uh, Korea went last and pretty spectacularly. But um, Indonesia fell by almost 80%. Uh, Korea and Malaysia fell by about half, uh, as well as Thailand. So um, if you were borrowing US dollars back here when things were stable and harmonious, and you had to pay them back uh, later when things were disharmonious, you generally needed at least twice as much local currency uh, to buy your dollar than you did um, before. Um, those of you who are volatility traders, I don't think we have any volatility traders in this uh, audience, but if you're a volatility trader, you would look at a chart like these. Um, this is the volatility of the uh, exchange rates. As you can see, it is almost nothing until the middle of 1997, and then your whole world uh, kind of goes uh, crazy. So this is just another way of looking at the same thing. The problem is when you have a fixed exchange rate, you have either an explicit or an implicit guarantee on the part of the government that you can borrow your dollars now for X number of local currency, and then later you can get X number of local currency and buy your dollar again. Um, if that breaks down, then you're going to have a serious dislocation. And what happened with these economies is they were actually running a little bit hot. Um, they had mismatches between uh, foreign currency and domestic currency. People were borrowing foreign currency, putting them into domestic currency projects. They were borrowing short term and investing long term. And it's a little bit like a bank run. Banks keep functioning as long as all the depositors don't want their money at the same time. If all the depositors want their money at the same time, then the bank has a problem. And in a way, uh, that's what happened to these um, uh, economies. Um, so the, the narrative, I mean, I think we can all figure out what happens. Your exchange rate breaks, you have a massive shock to confidence, you get defaults, you have bank failures, output starts to drop, employment starts to drop, confidence drops again, and you get this kind of very uh, nasty cycle uh, until everything reaches this kind of new uh, equilibrium. But this, is cause, this caused massive uh, dislocations in these uh, economies. When I uh, landed in Korea in late 97, just looking at people's faces, it looked like they were in shock. They didn't know what hit them, the streets were empty, everything was just totally, uh, totally dead. So it wasn't a happy uh, scenario. So these imbalances just broke, uh, built up to the part point where they were unsustainable and then it kind of uh, fell apart. So what were the causes? Uh, again, there's tons of literature on this. If you Google this, you'll find variations of all this kind of stuff. Uh, I've been harping for the last 10 minutes about fixed exchange rate regimes. Um, they only work as long as they are credible. So um, uh, countries promise to keep the exchange rate fixed. You have to be able to honor that pro uh, promise. Maybe you need a lot of reserves. You need a lot of flexibility uh, in the economy. But that led to a lot of uh, dangerous and unsustainable borrowing. Uh, currency mismatches, again, uh, a lot of uh, companies were borrowing uh, US dollars and lending in local currency. So as long as the exchange rate's fixed, that works. If the exchange rate's not fixed, that doesn't work. Uh, maturity mismatches, that's just banking. You borrow short and you lend long. And uh, very poor um, credit uh, assessment, right? The banks weren't doing a good job at looking at ability to repay. There was a lot of connected lending. There was a lot of what we call quasi-fiscal or quasi-governmental uh, le lending. So uh, the quality of the assets was declining as well. And uh, again, when it came time to pay, all of a sudden uh, you had long dated illiquid assets that may not have been worth their par value and there wasn't enough to cover these uh, short term runs on, um, on reserves. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit about Korea because as I said, Korea is where I uh, spent my time working and then I went back in 2001 and was the IMF rep uh, to Korea. So I know the data for Korea better than the other uh, countries. This is just a, um, a table of South Korea's debts. And uh, I think it's very illustrative because in a span of three years, you can see that the external debts almost doubled, uh, the short-term debt almost doubled. Uh, and then, you know, we're worried about Chinese debts doubling over a decade and uh, Korean debts doubling.
doubled over uh, three years. You will notice here there's almost no government debt. You will notice here there was almost no uh, central bank debt. So if you're sniffing around the public sector for signs of trouble, if we, if we cover that first part of the table and then look at this, this part, there's no problem. This country's got a fiscal surplus. There's no government debt. There's no uh, central bank debt. But all this kind of stuff uh, was building up. You can see the reserves here. The reserves actually got down to $1 billion at uh, one point, and I'll talk about that uh, in a sec. So this was a problem, and to make things worse, this is not the entire problem. Um, I don't know if you guys have thought a lot about accounting, but external debt is based on a residency basis. So if a Korean bank borrows money from an American bank in New York, if a Korean bank in Seoul borrows money from an American bank in New York, that's Korean external debt, okay? Because it's cross-border, it's residence. If a Korean bank in New York borrows money from an American bank in New York, that's not Korea's external debt because it's done between two US residences. It's Korea's national debt, it's a Korean borrowing from an American bank, but it's not external debt. So what happened in the crisis is not only the debt contracted in Korean by Korean banks, but the debt contracted abroad by Korean banks came back to the window at the Bank of Korea and said, we need dollars. Um, the, the external debt was X. Um, when we added in the debt that was sitting around the world from Koreans offshore, these amounts doubled. So we were only capturing half of the, uh, the debt. Korea wasn't doing anything wrong. They were following the rules of international debt reporting. It's just that the rules weren't thinking about, oh, maybe a Korean bank in New York is borrowing from a US bank in New York, and that could be a problem uh, someday. Um, this is my favorite chart. You can tell this is sort of an old mimeograph copy of something. My, my comms guy said the resolution's terrible. Take it out. I'm like, no, no, no. This is the coolest chart uh, in the whole pack. This is the what's called the rollover rate of of Korea's short-term debt. So think of all these foreign creditor banks, they're lending to Korean banks. As long as they roll their debt over, the whole thing is gonna stick together. So you can see um, you know, the rollover rate was close to 100%, which means, let's say you're the American bank lending to a Korean bank, you've got a 60-day uh, interbank credit, as long as you keep rolling that over every 60 days, uh, it's fine. This is where Korea got into trouble because after Thailand, um, broke its peg and the world, world was starting to get very worried, the Korean rollover rate dropped to about 20%. So all of a sudden, all these creditors want their money back and there's not enough money in the kitty uh, to pay all of them. That's why Korea went to the IMF and say, hey, we're in trouble, we need to borrow some uh, short term, you know, we need to borrow some US dollars to pay this off. And then you know, the fund will say, well, you need an adjustment program to fix your underlying problems and then the whole thing um, started. Uh, my claim to fame in this exercise, I was involved in that part right here. Um, what the IMF did in conjunction with the Fed, the Federal Reserve of the US was, we um, set up a system where we got all the um all the uh, creditor banks to agree to roll over their short-term loans. Uh, this is kind of a prisoner's dilemma. Most of you guys know what a prisoner's dilemma is. Individually, it's, everyone's, it's in everyone's incentive to cut their credit lines, take their money, and get out. Um, but there's not enough money to do that. So the collective solution is for everyone to roll over their money, and then you kind of can restructure the debts, and then you can take it out uh, in an orderly way. So what we did in this, um, in this exercise is we got agreements from all the major countries uh, at the IMF that their banks would roll over the credits to Korea. Uh, those, bank those debts would eventually be restructured into short-term loans everybody will get paid out uh, in the end. So that was kind of successful application of a prisoner's dilemma thing. Um, it was enforced through the IMF's executive board, so we would report back to the IMF executive board every day and say, you know, the German banks did this, the French banks did this, the Japanese banks did this, the American banks did this, and it was a sort of a policing effort. But anyway, the, the rollover rate of that debt was brought back up quickly and uh, kind of stabilized, but uh, that's just an example of, this was really nothing to do so much with Korea, it was really 
confident shocks coming from the rest of the world, and uh, the foreign creditors just decided to almost overnight pull the plug, and it was actually quite um, uh, dramatic. So uh, this is just basically uh, what I just told you. Um, we uh, got the foreign creditors uh, to roll over their money. Um, you know, this uh, this special survey was sent out by the Bank of Korea. They didn't even know how much foreign debt Korea had. They knew the external debt again. Korean banks in Seoul borrowing from uh, U.S. banks in New York, but they didn't know all the offshore stuff. So again, uh, there's different ways to measure debt. There are different ways to measure exports and a lot of things, but a residency basis, Korea versus the rest of the world, uh, was not the right way uh, to do it in this particular um, example. So um, let me talk about the IMF. I've mentioned them several times, and as I said, I used to work there. Um, there were kind of two views of the fund uh, during this time. Uh, view number one was this Western occupying army. These guys came in. We were we all had bless you. We all had these kind of funny suitcases back there. We were all wearing dark suits. Uh, I'm still wearing dark suits. But um, you know, you come in and you know you sort of impose all these conditions on these uh, countries. Uh, the other view is the uh, you know the funds a global financial firefighter. They only show up when a country you know runs out of reserves, partly because of bad policies, partly because of uh, bad luck. Um, I think there was a lot of initial criticism of the fund uh, because they you know for example in Korea they came in and said you guys have got to tighten the fiscal accounts even though there was a surplus and you have to raise interest rates to stabilize the currency. Um, I think the you know the the because they were coming in with a Latin model rather than a, a Asian model. I think those countries, uh, the, the IMF learned very quickly and, and repositioned its policies very quickly. And in the end, uh, I think history has judged that those adjustment programs actually worked. Uh, they worked uh, pretty well. Um, but um, Asian policy makers have decided that they are never again going to the IMF, which is why you see so many reserves uh, in the region now. They're like, never again are we going to run out of um, reserves. I'll show you that chart in a minute. The other thing that the Asian crisis did, and I think uh, a lot of people don't talk about this as much, is it started this movement to make the fund more international, right? So it's still a U.S kind of dominated institution, but there's more representation uh, in senior management of people uh, from emerging markets. Uh, we still have a, you know, a French managing director. The French have a sort of outsized outsize claim, it looks like, on the MD of the fund. Uh, but um, you know, this movement to have more uh, emerging market voices, uh, including from China, uh, there's a China uh, deputy managing director now, uh, came in part from the, um, the uh, Asia crisis. Um, this is my reserve chart. I, I should have taken this back another 10 years, but uh, basically all these countries ran out of money in 1997, and then there was a concerted effort uh, to rebuild their reserves. So these are reserves, foreign currency reserves as a percentage of GDP. Uh, again, the four crisis countries. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia are up uh, 30 to 50 percent. Uh, Korea's 25 or 30. Um, Indonesia's about 10. Korea got hit hard by the global financial crisis in 2008. They lost about a quarter of their reserves and they rebuilt them. So you can tell a story that if they didn't have the war chest, uh, they may have had a, you know, there's a probability they could have had a repeat of 1997, but the fact that they had built up this massive stock uh, of reserves is basically a form of self-insurance. So these firms, or sorry, these countries are all self-insuring so that they're able to weather the, uh, the storms in the uh, international uh, capital markets. So, uh, lessons for today. We saw the run-up to the crisis. We saw what happened. So, we should hopefully be learning something. Um, here's kind of my take, uh, since I've been around for a while now, and I can sort of make a claim to this. Um, every country is different. This is the idea that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Uh, there are some themes that you see uh, in all these crises, but every crisis is um, different. Problems can start in many places. Uh, it was short-term foreign currency borrowing uh, in the Asia crisis. It was uh, securitized mortgage instruments that started the problem uh, in the US and the global financial crisis. It was excessive fiscal spending in the Latin crisis of the 1970s and 80s. So it's not gonna be the same thing every time, so we have to be open-minded. And then this thing, you know, this difference between flows and stocks, right? Uh, the GDP is a flow. The trade exports and imports are a flow. 
the balance sheet, which is the stock of debt, the composition of the debt, the currency composition of the debt, the maturity composition of the debt, those were things that people weren't really following very closely uh, in the mid-90s. So that's, um, that's another lesson. Um, the data matter, I had this uh, example about residency data. Um, if that doesn't capture the offshore um, debtors. Um, capital account data are important too. I've got a funny, uh, interesting an anecdote about Argentina. Argentina uh, followed the um, Washington consensus in the 1990s. They totally liberalized the capital account. And then after the uh, Asia crisis hit, I remember I was on a team, we were asking uh, the Argentine authorities you know, to have some data on the capital account. And they're like, we don't collect any data. You guys told us to liberalize it. You can pick up the phone and get a loan and that's, you know, that's a free market. It. And um, so they weren't even actually collecting any data on the uh, on the loans in the country. So yes, the markets probably work better than non-markets, but you need to collect data and have some sort of idea uh, what's going on. Um, policies matter. Uh, I didn't talk too much about Indonesia. Indonesia did not act very forcefully, uh, to put it mildly, uh, in addressing their problems in the late 90s the way that Korea did. Uh, Indonesia had several ups and downs. They had a much bigger drop in output. Put. They had a much bigger uh, drop in um, uh, their currencies, and it took them a while. Uh, there were political issues uh, as well, as you all know. It took them longer to right the ship because they were kind of going back and forth on the policy uh, implementation. Uh, the fund, as we know, uh, took some hits for its initial policy um, prescriptions as well. And I think these are probably in reverse order. The first one's probably humility, right? Um, even really smart people can miss uh, events that look obvious obvious in hindsight, the kind of Washington consensus uh, took a big hit uh, in this crisis. And again, almost everyone, official sector, private financial sector, regulators, uh, they missed it because they were looking in the wrong places or they had the wrong data or they had the wrong model in their heads. So uh, these crises are all different and we need to be humble and uh, flexible. Which brings me to uh, the country that begins with C. I mean, I just spent 20 minutes talking about Asia and I didn't mention China. This never happens anymore, right? The only country people want to hear about these days uh, is China. China was obviously a much smaller country back then. It was a less systemically important uh, country back then. But, um, you know, why has China been able to go four decades almost uh, without any major financial crisis or without even many uh, financial blips. Uh, Deng Xiaoping started the reform drive in 1979, uh, 1980, and here we are in 2017. Uh, every couple of years, people jump up and down and say China's gonna have a hard landing. It never seems to happen. So is this magic or what's going on? I think a big part of this explanation, uh, aside from the Chinese authorities are very smart, pragmatic uh, people, is that they started very late. So they have this great benefit of seeing what doesn't work all across the world and not going there, right? So uh, I just listed four things here uh, which are very well known. The Chinese authorities know this and uh, they've decided to structure their economy in the way where they can kind of avoid uh, these, uh, these uh, risks. I mentioned this at the beginning, uh, the LATAM crisis, part of that came from this import substitution model. China uh, obviously adopted the export uh, promotion model, adds market discipline, and you save a lot. If you run current account surpluses and you fund yourself, then no external creditor can come and kind of pull the plug, right? Because you're a self-financing model, even to this day, um, even though its current account uh, surplus is smaller, uh, China is still basically a self-funded uh, model. Um, we haven't really talked about Eastern Europe, but remember when the Soviet Union collapsed, the thinking back then was let's do a big bang, right? Let's just open up the markets and market discipline will kind of make sure everything happens. And um, that didn't have a, have, have a very happy ending because banks and corporates and households didn't know how to manage foreign currency risk. They didn't know how to manage volatility. All the assets ended up in a small number of hands. These countries all had, or many of them had, uh, various types of currency uh, and banking crisis. So the lesson there for China is to liberalize slowly. You know, the uh, the system, you can't turn people from sort of communist to capitalist uh, just by opening up the capital account uh, very quickly. Asian financial crisis, I mentioned foreign currency mismatches before. 
curb short-term funding. Short-term funding is dangerous. The guy's got to roll over the debt. We saw what happened in Korea uh, when they don't roll over the debt. Uh, use capital controls. Capital controls were anathema in the 1990s. Uh, you know, no country wanted to use them. You get castigated by uh, the Washington consensus. Um, Chile was experimenting with some capital controls back then, but people said, you know, they don't really work or over time people figure out uh, how to get around them. Now it seems to be okay to put in some sort of capital controls, let the sticky money in, the foreign direct investment, but it's okay to steer clear of the, um, of the short-term stuff, uh, build up lots of reserves, and then global financial crisis, um, lots of complicated securitized products that people don't really understand. China actually banned securitized projects or uh, products after the global financial crisis. They're starting to build them out again. Um, auto loans, uh, for example, uh, are being securitized. But um, if you know all this stuff and you have good policy levers, you can kind of guide your economy uh, through the minefield. That's not a guarantee that China's never gonna have a financial crisis, but I think it's a very, um, persuasive, in my view, uh, explanation why China has been able to uh, avoid the problem. Starting late in the game lets you sit in the back seat and see uh, where most of the uh of the uh, problems are going to be. Okay, my final thought, people said, how do you know, uh, can you predict the next financial crisis? This is a, a well-known quote from Herbert Stein, who's a US economist, and that's the only words of wisdom I can offer you. If something uh, cannot go on forever, it will stop. <laughs> we don't know when, we don't know how, but uh, so that's why when people ask me about China or any other country, I talk about the trajectory. The trajectory is unsustainable. That means it's eventually going to have to change or it's going to have to uh, stop. I'm not going to write an airport novel that says the big financial crisis of 2020 and make a big call because those are a bit silly. But anyway, that's the last uh, slide of my presentation. I am happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for covering a lot of ground in a very short time. Very interesting. Um, if I may, before I open the floor to questions generally, I'd like to ask you one question myself, which is the obvious question: Could it happen again? Um, you know, uh, as, I, as, I'm, as, well, as is well known, there's been a huge build-up of um, corporate debt, in particular, including in Asia. A lot of it in foreign currencies. Um, people say, well, it can't happen again because there's plenty of reserves um, available to deal with emergencies. But as you were pointing out earlier in the anteroom, um, interest rates are coming off zero at the moment, and even a fairly, fairly small increase in interest rates could have a proportionally very large effect. So. Could it happen again? <laughs> Putting it rather crudely. Um, it wouldn't, if again means a perfect repeat of 97, probably not. Um, things, things, bad stuff tends to happen um, when it's not foreseen or not priced in. No one envisaged a world in the mid 90s where all of these exchange rate pegs in Asia would break. Um, no one envisioned a world in 2005, six in the US where all these mortgage-backed securities, which were trading on a par with US treasuries, is kind of you know alchemy that that whole thing would come uh, tumbling down. So um, what's not priced in, um, as um, Anthony said, there's a lot of uh, new debt in the world. Um, there's also a lot of new debtors in the world. We have had very uh, low rates for a very long time. And the question is, as we move back to, the, to normal, as the Fed goes back to some sort of normal Fed funds rate, I don't know if the new normal is three-ish or four-ish. Uh, the Fed seems to think it's closer to three-ish. Um, have firms and households and governments and everyone else kind of priced in that normalization uh, of rates? Um, just, just some simple arith arithmetic. Um, if interest rates uh, were normal, and they went from, let's say, 4% to 5%, your interest bill goes up by a quarter. Um, if interest rates go from 1% to 2%, your interest bill doubles. Same increase in rates, but now that we're so low, uh, we've got a lot more kind of upside to, uh, 
uh, to debt service. But um, that was a very long and somewhat non non-committal answer. For something to happen, it has to be a surprise. People haven't been forecasting the effects of these rate rises correctly. Um, maybe the Fed gets behind the curve in some scenario. We finally get some wage and price pressure in the US, and the Fed has to go faster. Uh, the Fed has been going uniformly slower than forecast uh, since uh, the crisis broke out. Uh, but something about the, there's got to be some sort of wedge between where people expect uh, the market and rates to go and where they actually go. And that readjustment from the, the expectations to the reality is when we get into uh, uh, trouble. Uh, might not be a foreign currencies run to zero type crisis, but uh, that would definitely cause some, some action. Thank you. OK, questions from the working press first. Did you? Yes? Um, we have a. should pass that around maybe, okay. Well, you're here, here. Oh, oh, it's over there, okay. Siegfried Nittl, uh, freelancer from Germany. Mm. What's the difference between the financial crisis 2007 and the 97 that the, the Fed and uh, perhaps also in, Jap in, Jap in Japan and other Europe, uh, the European banks um, did inflate the, the market with money and, and in 97, they shorted the market with money. So uh, two kind of very different kind of uh, solutions. But uh, and I think uh, in, in 97, there was a lot of uh, uh, critics on the on uh, IMF. Uh, they, they said uh, the IMF should uh, let the um, a currency fell fell down to uh, then the. Um, um, then uh, the, uh, the countries can recover by improving their exports. And, and China, is not China doing a, a similar policy like, uh, like uh, the Fed and uh, 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 Europe? Um, because um, I think in, in perhaps, in, especially in, an, in a crisis 2007, they, uh, um, the solution of the, of the crisis, the Chinese solution was of crisis, they initiated, initiated a kind of a construction boom. Uh, so the construction boom uh, helped uh, to uh, uh, the, the Chinese economy in, in this way. Yeah, okay. Um, well, let's start with the last one first. Um, China did not have a crisis in 2007. There was a big um, shock to global growth because of the mortgage-backed uh, security crisis that started uh, in the US. China launched an extremely successful fiscal stimulus plan, right? Wen Jiabao was premier. Um, the plan, if I recall, was four trillion uh, Chinese yuan. Um, China was able to keep its growth rate close to its target. I think it was seven and a half percent back then. Um, the IMF gave them the gold star. You know, China uh, is has been the biggest contributor to gr global growth uh, over the past decades. So that was um, that was uh, you know so that was good fiscal policy. Um, I think the issue with China is before the financial crisis, China. Because GDP and lending were growing at about the same rate, so the debt label ratios were stable. The big fiscal stimulus plan was a jump in the debt level, but China never went back to the, the path where lending and GDP were growing at the same rate. For the last half decade, China's lending has been growing at about twice the rate of its GDP, which is why its debt numbers are going up. Um, in terms of the, the exchange rate, the fund when these countries have a financial crisis, um, if you let the exchange rate go, you're going to wipe out the corporate sector because the trade, the the international part of the corporate sector, they've all borrowed dollars at let's say again 26 Thai baht per U.S. dollar. If the rate falls to 50 or 52, which is actually where it went, then they need twice as much money to repay their foreign debts. All the bank loans go bad. It feeds into the banking sector. The banking sector collapses. They run out of capital, and the government has to come in and recap. So the downside of that, you, you want to have the market work, and you want firms to repay their debt. But when the exchange rate starts falling that quickly, you have no good choices. You can let the market clear. The countries be can become a lot more competitive, 
but the debt wipes out the corporate sector and, and the banks. So the solution is to try to keep the exchange rate relatively stable, fix the problem uh, to make sure it hopefully doesn't happen again, and then hopefully you, uh, you uh, exit. But uh, the crisis, it's easy now, 20 years later, to put up some nice slides and talk about it. But if you're in the middle of it, you have some very bad choices, and you don't know all this stuff uh, t uh, that we know 20 years uh, later. So all you know is the economy's in free fall, they're out of reserves, banks are failing, firms are failing, and a lot of people are nervous, upset, and scared. And you have to try to figure out how to, how to solve the problem. And there are no good, uh, uh, there are no good uh, solutions. So a lot of these are, are compromises, and uh, sometimes you know what's going on, and sometimes you really don't have the the data to make a call. Yes, sir, in the back. Sorry. <laughs> Um, my name is uh, Ichiro Tokumoto, freelance for Japanese news magazine. Um, can I ask you a question about the connection between financial crisis and the behavior of financial market traders? Okay. Um, I was uh, in late 1980s, I was working for a news service uh, covering the Japanese banking crisis uh, in 1998 or 1999. And at that time, the, my impression was um, the behavior of uh, financial market traders, foreign exchange or bond traders, they accelerate the sense of panic in the market. For example, when I deliver the message of the prime minister of Japan or finance minister, traders in the market, without digesting, without understanding the message, they just react to their stories, uh, joining the bandwagon for example. So do you agree that uh, that's my observation, that the financial traders, the uh, short-term short -term behavior or short-term thinking and uh, reacting to the store news without understanding what it means, they sometimes uh, help accelerate the you know, panic in the market. And if so, do you think that we still have the same risk um, well, I, I did work for a bank, and uh, the traders were sitting a couple rows away from me, so let me give you my impression of uh, traders. Um, first of all, that market moves very, very quickly, right? So the whole thing about markets is markets are built on expectations. So everyone has a narrative. Uh, let's say the Fed is going to go very gradually over the next couple of years. When the market gets new information, let's say the Fed is gonna move a lot faster and we have to reprice the US yield curve, you have to move. Um, you may not understand all the second, third, fourth order effects of a faster uh, Fed rate hike pace, but you've gotta move because if you don't move and the rest of the street moves ahead of you, you're gonna lose a lot of money and lose your job. So um, they're not supposed to be deep thinkers, right? Um, they do kind of move in herds. Uh, I don't know if you know, John Maynard Keynes has a famous example, which he calls the beauty contest example. Um, if you look at all the, the, the firms in a, in a market, uh, you don't pick the firms with the best financial, you pick the firms that you think the market is gonna, you pick the most beautiful firms, right? So you're, if you're a trader, you're trying to figure out what the rest of the market's gonna do and you need to get there first. Um, what the rest of the market's gonna do may not be rational, may not be uh, fundamentally driven, but if you don't get there ahead of them, you're gonna lose a lot of money and lose your job. So this is, uh, I think, a cautionary tale of why you don't want a lot of short-term, very sensitive things on your portfolio because the market, you know, the market moves very, very quickly. Um, these guys have portfolios they're running. They need to position them uh, as fast as possible when information moves. But it's to me, it's all about information. I mean, my, uh, my boss, who uh, Anthony knows as well, Paul Sheard, um, you know, he describes markets as big information processing machines. And when the information changes and you think it's here and it's over there, the market just reprices it and it prices it in a very fast, brutal, and inefficient way, which I think is a tale that 
we want longer term sticky money and we don't want short term volatile money. So uh, again, China's done a good job. I mean, if you want to think of a country that has kind of opened itself up to the longer term stickier flows and not so much the bank flows like Korea did. You can make the argument that Korea opened itself up backwards. They took the volatile stuff first rather than last. But you know, that's a cautionary tale. There's a lot of liquidity and benefits there, but they move quite quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Can you identify yourself, please? Oh. <clears throat> Nicholas Smith, CLSA. Is there anything at all that uh, Europe has learnt from the Asian financial crisis, and is there any way at all that it is not like the uh, Asian situation pre-1997? Okay. Um, well, I don't think Europe is going to have a foreign currency crisis because the euro is a reserve currency, so we can probably rule um, that one out. For me, it's more of a debt issue. Um, you know, the question is, you have a lot of highly indebted countries on the periphery uh, who are not very competitive. They have large amounts of debts. Um, paying off those debts will take quite some time and for Europe as a whole, I'm not a European, so uh, I don't know how to make this call, but for Europe as a whole, is it better to have those, those countries adjust over long periods of time? Um, if you look at the IMF staff report for Greece, it is a multi-decade adjustment to get back to debt sustainability. Or is the lesson that some of the debt should be forgiven in exchange for structural reforms to get those countries uh, growing again? It's more of a political uh, economy question. My view is that when there's a crisis, um, and I've seen this several times, if people understand there's a problem and they're willing to make sacrifice, they are willing to make sacrifices to solve the problem, but the results have to come quickly. So Korea as an example, Thailand probably as an example too, where those countries turned around pretty quickly in a year or so and they were growing again. Asking a population to you know, adjust over decades with uh, gains that are way out in the future, I'm not sure that's a sustainable political economy model. I mean, people are going to make sacrifices if they can see the make, see gains that are tangible. Okay. Um, if if this uh, yeah, question over here, does on please. Hello, uh, my name is Yasuhiro Fujiki from Shinsei Bank. I'm a user of SP service to the bank. Uh, my question is the about the contingent liability that of, by the government of Asian countries. When we look at the balance sheet of, of Asian countries, it seems okay, uh, mostly the investment grade. However, for example, the, in Malaysia, YMDB issue uh, shows that potential contingent liability uh, exists, such as the government guarantees mm -hmm. and also COSI government project. So how do you see, how should we look at such uh, contingent liability bared by uh, Asian countries when you look at sovereign risk? Yeah, uh, well first, I'm not a sovereign credit analyst, so I have to be very careful. I can give you the economics answer. If you have a specific question about a specific contingent liability on a specific country, I can direct you to the right um, sovereign analyst. For me, it's all about size and probability, right? Uh, most governments have some sort of contingent liability, uh, right? There's a promise uh, to pay some other entities' debts in some uh, state of the world. Uh, it's a big issue in China right now with local government uh, debt uh, and other um, non-central government debts. Um, I guess when you look at it, you decide how big those are and what the probability that they come on to the uh, on the balance sheet, right? This happened in the U.S. as well with these sieves, right? The uh, the structured investment vehicles that were off the balance sheet uh, until the money dried up, and then they came back on uh, to the balance sheet. So I think the way to think about those is. Um, you know, how big is it and how likely is it to become an actual government uh, liability? They can be large, right? If you read the IMF staff report on China, uh, the fiscal deficit n measured narrowly is 3% of GDP, and when you add on the contingent liabilities, I think it's 11% of GDP. So there can be quite 
a lot of stuff. But um, I don't want to stray into the sovereign territory too much. So if you have a if you have a specific question, I can I can I can you know one MDB. I can direct that to the right guys. Yeah. I just want to ask you quickly about a, um, a crisis within a crisis. I mean, Japanese banks have been lending an awful lot of money overseas recently, um, part, probably partly because the conditions here are so unpromising. And of course, they don't lend yen overseas, they lend dollars. In order to lend dollars, they have to borrow dollars. And as interest rates rise on dollars, the, many people think these banks are going to get into trouble. Uh, so A, do you think there's a possibility of the bank, Japanese banks getting into trouble? And B, um, why is the yen not more acceptable to foreign borrowers? Why can Japanese banks not make more yen loans, for instance, in Asia? Yeah, well, um, let me take those in reverse order. There's, um, you know, there's this uh, view uh, written by, actually, a former boss of mine. There's a book called The Dollar Trap, um, written by Ishwar Prasad. He's Professor Cornell. He's actually my former boss uh, at the fund. But um, he poses the question, I think, Anthony, a different way of asking your question about the U.S. crisis, uh, the global financial crisis, is the global financial crisis erupts in 2008. It was triggered by the mortgage market in the U.S. And what happened? The U.S. dollar strengthened because the world got nervous. Uh, financial markets, including our famous traders, they pile into the global risk-free asset, and that is the U.S. dollar. So even when the U.S was the epicenter of a global financial crisis, the US dollar strengthens because it's seen as the global risk-free asset. The US treasuries are seen as a global risk-free asset. Um, we do see a little bit of this with the yen. Uh, when markets get nervous and we have these so-called risk-off episodes where um, investors are lightening their risk load and they go into um, uh, more safe assets, the yen typically strengthens in those episodes. So the yen definitely has characteristics of a reserve currency. It's also in the um, special drawing rights of the IMF. It's one of the four, uh, I guess, five now currencies that the yuan uh, is in there. But for some reason, and I think this is your point, the yen isn't seen as sort of a contractual currency. So when you see two entities making a financial contract in Asia, it's either done in the local currency or in the US dollar. Uh, we're still a US dollar uh, region. Uh, markets are funny that way. I mean, uh, you know, before the Second World War, it was all pound sterling, and then uh, it switched over uh, for reasons I think we all know uh, to be in the US dollar uh, after the Second uh, World War. The um, the first question, I mean, you'd have to look at the balance sheets of the banks, right? Uh, Japanese banks, although they um, should be able to enjoy the fact that the yen is a reserve currency, they have to lend in dollars. Uh, so if they've got assets in dollars, obviously they need uh, liabilities in dollars. So I don't know whether they're matched or not. Uh, it's probably a question for a, a bank analyst or a bank uh, regulator. But if the dollar, if the exchange rate moves against them, that could be a problem, right? So. Any more questions from the floor? Um, yes, George. My name is Baumgartner. I'm working for Swiss Television. What, what about Japan, about the Japanese debt, about uh, the abe abe so-called abenomics, lack of structural reforms? How do you explain that uh, Japan uh, ne never uh, came back uh, from, from its own uh, financial crisis uh, 30 okay. years ago? OK. Um, let me sort of start with two, I'll start you with a, a kind of a joke, <laughs> and then uh, a sort of a fact that I think is overlooked. Um, first, there's a, a famous economist whose name is Simon Kuznets. Um, he did national accounts in the 1930s. He did development economics in the 1940s. Uh, he has a famous expression that there are four types of economies in the world. There are developing economies, developed economies, Argentina and Japan. So these are the four types of, and, and the reason he said that is if you look at all the major economies in the world, Japan is the only one that has a large fiscal deficit and a large external surplus. You don't see any other country in the world. Usually the deficits, as I was showing, uh, or the surpluses go uh, together. So. Um, while Japan has a lot of domestic debt, uh, you can argue about the quality of that debt, the external war chest, if we can use that term, is absolutely enormous. So even in a so-called bad scenario, uh, Japan can 
gradually sell down the family jewels and keep that going for a long time without uh, going into uh, uh, foreign creditors. Um, the other thing that I think gets overlooked on Japan is um, the fact that if you start talking about real variables versus nominal variables, Japan looks a lot better. So I'm, I'm remembering this chart in The Economist magazine ranks the OECD countries in terms of real GDP growth and Japan's at the bottom. Slowest growth in the OECD. Next to that, they have the per capita real GDP growth and Japan is second. Japan's second because the population is shrinking. So if you think that the only thing that matters in the long run is productivity growth and you can sort of proxy that by per capita GDP growth, Japan doesn't look so bad. So Japan doesn't have a real problem, Japan has a nominal problem. And most, we economists don't think well in nominal terms, but basically the combination of a large stock of debt and zero or negative nominal GDP growth is like the kiss of death because the nominal debt stock has to be paid if GDP is falling in nominal terms and incomes are falling in nominal terms, the real debt burden goes up. So Japan's challenge, and Mr. Abe gets this, Mr. Kuroda gets this, is to generate some nominal GDP growth. Japan doesn't have a real GDP growth problem. It has a nominal GDP growth problem. Hence, the medium term target of getting nominal GDP growth to 3%. Uh, in most countries, that would be seen as almost a joke, but in Japan, this is proving to be a really tough slog, getting nominal GDP growth to 3 which roughly breaks out 2% inflation and 1% uh, real growth. Um, we think that Mr. Abe and Mr. Kuroda are on the right track. Um, I've read a lot of Mr. Kuroda's speeches. I've actually seen him speak. Um, I buy the argument that Japan now has deflation behind it. Uh, Japan hasn't seen deflation in several years. The trick in Japan is getting to 2% inflation, and this has proven to be very difficult, despite the fact that the central bank is what I would like to call responsibly irresponsible, right? Uh, Mr. Kuroda will keep buying assets. He will keep pushing down the yield curve. He's got a 0% yield commitment uh, on the 10-year uh, JGB, and yet we are not seeing any signs of a pickup in wage and price pressures. Um, the reason I think this is not happening, and again, this is Bank of Japan research, uh, has to do with inflation expectations. If you are a firm, uh, if you are a worker, if you are a household, um, you want to be looking at what's going on in the economy. How's growth doing? What's the central bank doing? Where are interest rates? What's going on in the rest of the world? So. You're forming your expectations, and what we want to happen in Japan is we actually want to see a wage price spiral. We want to sit people to say, oh, the labor market looks tight, GDP growth looks pretty good, uh, maybe we should you know, pay more wages to attract workers, maybe that spills over to income, maybe we get a little bit of inflation. Um, where am I going with this? There's a Bank of Japan study that shows Japanese households have the most backward-looking inflation expectations in the world, okay? If you're the central bank, you want people to look forward. You want people to look at growth. You want people to look at trade. You want people to look at productivity. You want people to look at central bank policy. What am I doing with my instruments to monetary conditions to try to get my inflation target? Um, this Bank of Japan study looked at the US, looked at Europe, looked at the UK, and looked at Japan, and by far, Japanese households and firms are the most backward looking people in the world. So they're looking in the rear view mirror what's been happening for the last 20 years rather than paying attention to the policy uh, pronouncements of the central bank. And if they do that, it's very, very hard to get inflation expectations up. Okay. If the labor market continues to be tight, if growth continues to be strong by Japanese standards, um, I'm sure you've seen lots of expert panels on Japan. Uh, I don't consider myself to be an expert on Japan. These panels always say all the ingredients are in place to get some wage pressure, and you know we've been hearing that for the last year or two. Um, Japan's looking better than it has in the macro for quite some time, but we need to start seeing wage and price pressures. So success.
is going to be measured, in my view, whether we can get some wage pressure, we can get some inflation pressure, and then we can get nominal growth up to three. Nominal growth up to three is success for uh, Japan. BOJ has partial victory. We've exited deflation, but it is proving to be extremely difficult to get inflation from zero-ish to two-ish. If you told an economist that 20 years ago, they would laugh at you. They said, what do you mean? Any, any central bank can create inflation. You just push interest rates down to zero and you buy every asset you can in the economy. And that's uh, only had incremental progress in Japan so far. Uh, we are up against time, actually. Would you, can you take just one more question? Yep. Yes, OK. Over there. If you promise yes. a short question, I'll Sorry. promise a short answer. How's that? <laughs> Japanese, uh, um, um, the Bank of Japan buys, I think, every year 70% of the uh, Japanese uh, government bonds. Is this a kind of a st sustainable policy? Um, well, at some point, they could conceivably own all the government bonds. Um, when you think about it, that's just an asset swap. Because what they've done is, let's say you're a bank. You used to hold JGBs, which is a claim on the government. If the BOJ buys all those from you, you now have a claim on the BOJ rather than a claim on the, the government. But they're the same thing. They're the consolidated public sector. One of them has a maturity date. The JGB has a maturity date. The claim on the BOJ is like a perpetual. So you're just changing one form of public sector asset uh, for the other. Um, again, I would say. That's an, that's an interesting question, but by doing that, can the Bank of Japan get people to raise their inflation expectations, right? That all of that asset buying is designed to loosen monetary conditions, keep yields low, keep asset prices high, and sort of degenerate the, the ecosystem where we can see some inflation. So uh, I think in your, that question to me is just an asset swap. You're, uh, if you sort of take the, the government debt broadly, the JGBs out in the market go down and the BOJ kind of debt in this case uh, goes up. But uh, the aim there is to generate the inflation and wages we need to solve that part of the problem. I have a paper on that if you want to read it. It's quite interesting. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. We, we're unfortunately out of time, just as the debate is getting interesting. Thank you very much, Paul, for coming and educating us on the, uh, so many things. Um, it's your first time here, but we don't want it to be the last time, so please accept a one-year honorary membership. Oh, thank you very Come much. Come back whenever you, when you're available. Thank you very much. <laughs>